So welcome. This is the fourth week in Raised on the Third Day, Exploring the Resurrection. This is our fourth week, and as I, I think I shared in previous weeks, this is where we're getting really much closer to familiar land with the New Testament as we're going to study the Pharisees um, and what we know about the Pharisees, and in particular about uh, their view of the resurrection and how that also, again, provides some of the backdrop to uh, the New Testament's conception of the resurrection and the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of believers and, and, and so forth. Um, before we jump in there, let me go ahead and uh, offer a word of prayer and we will we'll get right in. Loving and living God, we are grateful for technology that allows us to learn together remotely uh, even as we celebrate and, and are grateful for this, we are also hopeful and expectant of the time when we'll be able to worship and study and fellowship together in person. We ask God that we would all have our ears tuned to wisdom's whisper, that we would be able to listen to whispers, to wisdom's invitation, that we might learn from wisdom, that we might become a wise people, a people who are passionate for the ways of wisdom, for the ways of justice for the ways of inclusion and for the ways of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask God that your spirit would come into this place that we might have new hearts, uh, new minds uh, and spirits to learn and to respond to what we've learned. In Jesus name we pray, amen. As, uh, as is normal uh, with, with this, I, I do recommend that, that you have um, your Bible nearby or a, an online application that would allow you to um, participate in uh, th some of the scriptural texts. We will, as I said, get into some New Testament texts tonight because we're, we're touching base with the Pharisees. And uh, if you've read the Gospels, even if you've read the letters of Paul, you know that the Pharisees uh, uh, appear in some pretty significant ways. Um, uh, also, uh, feel free to have a journal or a piece of scratch paper. I've already shared the link to the slides, um, and so feel free to, to access those now or access them at a later date. Um, I did want to note that in the slides, you'll see that there is some text that is blue and underlined, and that's hyperlinked text. So that's going to take you somewhere else uh, to some resources that, that I've either, either used in my preparation um, or that I found to be helpful resources for the purpose of sort of going a little bit deeper. So there, those resources are there for you. And um, as, I've, as we've done in the past, feel free to use the chat feature in Zoom to, you know, throw up a question um, uh, or, you know, say, you know, slam the brakes, Chris, you're going too fast. Um, and I, I try to, to respond to those comments as I see them. Uh, I want to give you just a brief overview of, of where we're headed in our discussion of the Pharisees. I, I, I do, you know, more and more see this as a, as a class that's building a trajectory or an argument towards uh, the New Testament. And so I do think it's important to sort of review the steps that we've taken to get here. Uh, so I'll do that briefly. Um, the second part of the night is I just want us to, to remind ourselves about who were the Pharisees. What do we know about the Pharisees? Where do we get our knowledge about the Pharisees? Um, so that when we begin to think about them and their view of the resurrection, we at least have some sense of, of who they are, who they were, um, and so forth. Uh, then for the third part of class, we're just going to turn our attention to some of the texts that we, we know of about what the Pharisees say about resurrection. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about Paul the Pharisee, uh, and you'll see I've got a question mark, uh, an ellipsis almost, and what about Jesus? Um, and uh, whether or not Jesus would, would be thought of as a Pharisee, um, or at least if there's, there's some, some evidence from the Gospels that he's at least influenced by some of their thinking, um, or at least engaged in some of their conversations, we'll see. Uh, and then uh, we'll have some time for discussion and questions at the end, as well as some in the middle um, as we go. So that's the, that's the plan for tonight. Uh, just by way of review, this is my best, uh, my best uh, effort to capture in one slide what we've done over the past three weeks. And clearly I'm, I'm summarizing and leaving out lots of details. But remember that in the week one, sort of the, the major point of week one is that there is very little reflection on the afterlife in the Old Testament, and that includes the resurrection, very, very little. Uh, in fact, there are minor exceptions that sort of prove that rule. 
Um, and then in week two, we sort of zeroed in on those exceptions, particularly from the text of D Daniel 12, but also some from the middle of Isaiah. And uh, we, we sort of learned, we made, the, we made the statement, we concluded that the resurrection idea, the idea of God's resurrection is really born out of a period of persecution and suffering. It's really born out of an experience of a delay or a perceived delay in God's justice. Um, if, if normal wisdom tells us that, that, that good people get good things and bad people get bad things and all of this happens in people's lives, then what Daniel 12 and, and some of these other early Jewish writings tell us is that that system, that way of viewing the world was breaking down um, because it was the most righteous, the very, very righteous who experienced persecution and even death. And it was their their murderers and their oppressors who seemed to benefit, who seemed to have all of the um, the, the the advantages um, and and so forth. And so um, so so that's that, that's really where the resurrection idea is born. It's born in this problem of of God's justice or the or the apparent delay in God's justice. And then last week, if you were with us, we took a sort of a whirlwind tool tour of intertestamental Judaism, or, or what I call, we might call Second Temple Judaism, or early Judaism is another phrase that people use to describe this period. And we sort of tracked some of the ways that this resurrection idea develops. Um, and in particular, how it is, in many ways, all these texts are building on um, material from Daniel 12, or perhaps earlier material from the book of Enoch, and how we saw, you know, I think we saw five or about five case studies or samplings of, of, the, of the resurrection idea and sort of how they're worked out. And you'll remember from, from last week that, that some of these texts imagine that the, the idea that resurrection will happen sort of at the end of days, um, you know, at the, the, the eschaton, the, the last time, and that it will happen that, that all of the people, you know, good and bad, ugly and, and, and sad, they'll all be raised up from the dirt and every single human being from all of eternity will stand before the judgment seat of God and some will go on to judgment or to punishment and some will go on to good life. Um, but that even though like that's what we see in fourth, uh, fourth Ezra, that is by no means the only understanding of the resurrection and that in second Maccabees, it, se or it seems like people are going almost instantly to an experience of eternal life of resurrection. Um, some of fourth, some of the book, the witnesses from Enoch suggested that um, really it's just a, an interest in what we might call an immaterial or immortal soul um, with very, with much less interest in whether or not there's a body that accompanies that soul. Um, and so sort of the subtext of last week was that there, there's a good amount of diversity um, in this, this period, this two to 300 year period um, of reflecting on the resurrection idea, of building on the resurrection idea. And of course, that experience of persecution that is highlighted in Daniel 12 is reflected in many of these texts and then continues into the Roman period. Um, the, the Jews of Palestine had, had a very tumultuous relationship with, with their Roman occupiers. And, and so the resurrection thinking, the desire to, to find a way to protect and preserve God's justice through the idea of resurrection continues in this period. So that's really where we've been, um, and I, I, I'm super. As I was, as I was telling Karen and Alice before class, that I, I, it's just been so fun for me to have to uh, sort of read my way into this material because I'm learning it as I'm teaching it, and I'm, you know, I'm beginning to see connections with the New Testament, and and so really, I'm just grateful that y'all are y'all are joining the, you know, my learning process, uh, and I'm grateful for that. So. Um, let us let's turn now to um, the the material from tonight, which is the Pharisees. And so, you know, I think it's an important um, it's an important place to start. And I'll and I'll I'll come back to this, but just let me name it in in, in advance that the Pharisees um, are probably the characters in the New Testament that have the the worst rap. Right? They they get the they have the baddest reputation. Uh, with all due respect to Taylor Swift, um, and. And, and, and some of this, um, most of this, uh, reflects 
a very contentious nature between uh, between the the earliest Christians and the Pharisees or their representatives, and and so we need to we need to handle the texts that speak of the Pharisees with some care, uh, and with some and some and some humility as interpreters, and and with as much as we can begin to understand who the Pharisees actually were as opposed to maybe how the Pharisees are depicted in the Gospels, um, because the Gospels don't present them as in an objective way, um, but uh, they depict them uh, in, in many of the ways that, that we experience political divisiveness today or um, social divisiveness today. Um, you know, a, a died in the wool wo- uh, Republican uh, may not say the most objective things about a died in the wool wo- 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 uh, Democrat, and like, and, and vice versa. And so, we do well uh, to to learn about the Pharisees and, and familiarize ourselves with with who they were and what we know about them from sources beyond the New Testament. So, um, the Pharisees, the name Pharisee. Um, derives from the Hebrew root parash, which means to separate. And it is unclear to scholars who specialize in the Pharisees whether or not this sort of derivation, this nickname, those who separate themselves, we might say, whether or not this was a name that the Pharisees claimed for themselves sort of in pride, like, yes, we separate ourselves because we, we follow uh, cultic or uh, purity laws at a higher level than all of those other people. Um, uh, so, so it's possible that they, they sort of wore this as a badge of honor it's also possible that other Jews or, and, and maybe non-Jews sort of pushed it on them and said, oh, those are those people who think they're separate from us. They think they're better than us. They think that they're, they're holier than us. Um, and so it's, it's really not clear where, where the derivation of their name comes from. Um, and, and probably either of those is, 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 is possible. But what really matters is that the, the idea of separateness is something that goes in to what it means to be a Pharisee. Um, generally speaking, although it's, it's not a, a, a clear A to B line of development, uh, the Pharisees are generally regarded as the forerunners of what would become known as rabbinic Judaism uh, it, around the middle of the second century CE. Um, and I'll, what, what, I'll, what I'll say just sort of now about that is that in the first century, when Josephus, who we'll talk about in just a little bit, when he was writing about Judaism in his day, there were, there were three or four varieties of Judaism, we might say, um, and that th- those varieties were allowed to exist um, up to a certain point. But with the destruction of the temple in 70, and then again in 135 with the destruction of Jerusalem, they just, the Romans just demolished Jerusalem and made it a capital offense for Jews to be back in Jerusalem. By that time, um, the rabbis um, and their followers, or the Pharisees and their followers, were sort of the only variety of Judaism that could survive. And so uh, you can think about it almost of, you know, in, in Darwinian terms, survival of the fittest. Um, the Pharisee, the, the party of the Pharisees won out because all of the other parties by 135 or 150 CE simply ceased to exist. Um, and so um, we, we learn about the Pharisees. We, 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 we hear about the Pharisees primarily through three sources. Um, Josephus, who I've already mentioned, the New Testament, and later Jewish writings um, uh, that, that emerge uh, in the second century CE, but are, but are edited and, and, and really are, are, are not codified until much later. And so we, we always have to do some of the work of trying to sift down what is a later edition um, and what is sort of reflecting earlier traditions or earlier understandings. So who were uh, the Pharisees, according to Josephus? Now, the, the first place to start this question is to answer the question, who the heck is this Josephus character? And, and some of you are saying, oh, I've heard about Josephus. I've read a book about Josephus. And some of you are saying, unless you're talking about Joe that lives next door, I have no idea who you're talking about. Um, so Josephus um, was a contemporary of the Apostle Paul. Um, uh, more or less, he might have been a bit younger, 
his dates uh, were roughly 37 to 100 CE. And so what that means is he was alive uh, for most of the New Testament period. Uh, he was born uh, a few years after Jesus was, was crucified and resurrected. And so he, he sort of knew the period of the New Testament. And he is a historiographer. He is a historian um, uh, in, 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 in the ancient sense of the word. And so in his life, he wrote literally, you know, bookshelves full of work. Um, one of his most famous work is called the Jewish Antiquities. And basically what he does is he starts with Genesis and works his way up to his contemporary period. And he sort of retells the scriptural traditions. He retells the Old Testament and then the, the intertestamental period and provides just a rich source of his story and, and sort of uh, background to Judaism and antiquity and by extension, the New Testament. So he's just a, he's a vital source for our understanding of that period that I introduced last week, intertestamental Judaism. Um, so that's, that's really who Josephus was. People who specialize in the study of, of Josephus um, would, would, would raise the issue that originally Josephus was, was a soldier, a Jewish soldier, um, who was captured and sort of spent the rest of his life um, uh, trying to create a friendly picture of Judaism and of different parts of Judaism to his Roman captors, to, who would sort of eventually become, I don't want to say benefactors, but would be, become sort of his primary audience. And so um, in many ways, he's writing from a pro-Roman perspective. And so we, we will engage his writing and, and scholars engage his writing with a little bit of that sort of mentality running in their heads. He's not going to give um, maybe the most unbiased opinion of those Jews who were, who were dead set on uh, fighting Rome to the death and who would, who would happily... Um, who, you know, stick a knife in a Roman soldier and run away rather than subject themselves to another year of oppression. Um, he's got, he's got nothing positive to say about those people. Uh, and so in many ways he is writing to present Judaism as, um, something that, that can, can ultimately be agreeable with the Roman state, um, something that, um, can, can be submissive to the Roman state, we might say, and that, really those people who were rebellious are just a small segment of society, um, of the Jewish society. So again, just a super um, important resource and, and source for our understanding of the ancient world. So when we get into the writings of Josephus, um, uh, and this is in his, his Jewish war, his Jewish antiquities, and, and as well as a little bit in his, he has his own autobiography. Um, uh, when we get into these sources, he talks about Judaism in terms, or he borrows terms from ancient philosophy. Um, so you might think about um, the Epicureans, um, uh, or you might think about uh, the Stoics, uh, or the, the Platonists. These names might be familiar to you from your days in Western civilization, um, or ancient philosophy. Um, and so oftentimes, he'll sort of take um, one, of the, one of the schools of Judaism, as he calls them, and he'll sort of make them run parallel to one of the ancient schools of philosophy. Um, most scholars interpret this as a, as a desire to sort of translate Judaism to a non-Jewish audience, to make it more understandable, more um, accessible to those that wouldn't understand it otherwise. And so in it, he presents, uh, in one place, he says there's three schools of ancient Judaism, and another place, he says there's a fourth. Um, uh, and uh, so he describes them as the Pharisees, who we're going to talk about, the Sadducees, who we'll say a couple things about, the Essenes, um, and the Zealots. Now, I'm not going to talk much about the Essenes or the Zealots tonight. Um, the Essenes um, are maybe, possibly, um, scholars kind of think that there's some connection between the Essenes and Josephus's description of the Essenes and the Jews who lived um, outside of Jerusalem in the area around the Dead Sea, um, uh, around the, the, the establishment of Qumran. Um, and so uh, there's, there's some connection 
between the, the Jews who lived at Qumran and the Essenes, although scholarship continues to sort of uh, really test that relationship and the degree to which it's a one-to-one -one re re relationship. And so, um, so this is this is really um, where we we dig in now to the Pharisees and and Josephus's description of the Pharisees. And so, um, I'm going to go ahead and read this. It's a pretty long quotation from Josephus, but it, it'll give you a feel of sort of how he goes about describing these schools, um, and and sort of what they're what they're like, and 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 what they're uh, how they how they're characterized. So here we go. The, the Jews had, for a great while, had three sects of philosophies peculiar to themselves. The sect of the Essenes and the sect of the Sadducees, and the third sort of opinions was that of those called Pharisees. Now, for the Pharisees, they live meanly and despise delicacies and diet, and they follow the conduct of reason and what that prescribes to them as good for them to do. And they think they ought earnestly to strive to observe reason's dictates for practice. Just to pause there and 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 say that the emphasis on reason, um, the the emphasis on the good. These are all terms that that Josephus's Roman audience would have would have been registering with, and would have been saying, "Oh, I see what you're doing here." We also know of. Uh, Greek or Roman philosophers who uh, talked about reason and conducting themselves with reason and living a austere life and not re resorting to delicacies and so forth. They also pay uh, respect to such as are in years, nor are they so bold as to contradict them in anything which they have been introduced. And when they determine that all things are done by fate, they do not take away the freedom from men of acting as they think fit. Now, Josephus here is, is likening the Pharisees to those who have a high view of providence in Presbyterian terms or fate in the, in the language of ancient philosophy, um, but they, they, they have a balance that with human freedom. So there's a balance, very Calvinist perhaps, um, or maybe Wesley, more Wesleyan, that there is a balance, a dance between divine sovereignty or fate and human responsibility. So that's, that's what he's arguing right here. And, and he's, again, he's signaling to these very longstanding philosophical debates in antiquity. Mm -hmm. um, so he continues, um, since their notion is that it hath pleased God to make a temperament whereby what he wills is done, but so that the will of man can act virtuously or viciously, right? So the providence and human freedom. They also believe that souls, here we're beginning to get into some resurrection language, whole souls have an immortal rigor in them, and that under the earth there will be rewards or punishments according as they have lived virtuously or viciously in this life. And the latter are to be detained in an everlasting prison, but the former shall have power to revive and live again, on account of which doctrines they are able greatly to persuade the body of the people, and whatsoever they do about divine worship, prayers, and sacrifices, they perform them according to their direction, insomuch that the cities uh, give great attestations uh, uh, to them on account of their entire virtuous conduct both in the actions of their lives and their discourses also. So we, we learn uh, a number of, of important things in this brief discussion. Again, I've already called attention to the ways in which Josephus's description is gesturing, is pointing to these larger philosophical debates. Uh, we began to see some stuff about resurrection. And here as well, we begin to see uh, that according to Josephus, the Pharisees were popular among the Jewish masses. They were able to persuade a great body of the people um, with their teachings, with their ways of life. Um, and so they, they had a somewhat of a sway over the populace, we might say. Um, one, one thing that uh, a scholar, Claudius Setzer, has, has provided for us um, is some of the characteristics characteristics of the Pharisees that emerge from Josephus. And I think these are helpful um, because we will see aspects of these characteristics 
present in the New Testament as well, and certainly present in the later Jewish writings as well. And so at the, the first is what I just mentioned, that they, they held a, a sort of sway among the, among the masses. They, they, their teachings were popular. The, the Pharisees, according to Josephus, were also very rigorous, very precise in the observation and interpretation of the law. They were, they were strict in this regard. They also had a devotion to uh, what jo Josephus will call the traditions of the elders. And, and this refers to primarily the oral tradition related to the law that sprung up along the written text. And one of the things that will separate the Pharisees from their rivals, the Sadducees, is that the Sadducees are the, are the first, you know, sola scriptura folks. They won't believe anything that they can't find in the Old Testament. And so one of the reasons the, the Sadducees are depicted in Josephus and in the New Testament as not believing in the resurrection is because they can't find it in the, in the Old Testament, just like we did with week one. Um, and so the Pharisees, in contrast, began to accept as authoritative a whole collection of oral traditions that spring up um, uh, from, from, from years before our period. They are also characterized as having a very strict knowledge of scripture and, and the accuracy of interpretation. And as we just saw, they, they had a belief in the afterlife, some form of the afterlife, some understanding of an afterlife, um, and, and in some cases what we would describe as resurrection. So that's sort of a, a, a very broad brushstroke of the Pharisees and how they appear in the writings of Josephus. Now, when we get to the New Testament, this is our second source for understanding the, the, the Pharisees. Um, as I already mentioned, we really need to be aware that, that the, the New Testament was written, the Gospels were written, um, in a period in which um, those who followed the, the teachings and the authority and, and the, the, the character of Jesus often found themselves in conflict with those who followed um, the teachings and the traditions of those associated with the Pharisees or, or, or the synagogue, we might say. And so, again, they're writing as rival interpreters. They're writing as rival claimants to the traditions of Israel, um, uh, at least in the, you know, before the, the second century CE. It's right for us to think about early Christianity really as one of those sects, one of those schools of philosophy within Judaism, since most of its teachers and many of its adherents were Jewish themselves. And so um, it's important for us to, to be aware of this bias. Um, what we do see um, pretty clearly in the Gospels and in Acts is that the Pharisees, one of the distinguishing marks of the Pharisees, is that they, they have this belief in the resurrection. We see this in the Gospels, we see this in Acts, we see this in Paul's letters. Um, and that in addition, many of these other characteristics that we saw in Josephus are present as well. The, the sort of the, the, the sway on the masses is suggestive of the New Testament. Um, the, the accuracy and the, the rigor of interpretation of scripture uh, is also, you know, the Pharisees are often presented as being highly meticulous in their application of the law, of what counts, of what's legal, of what's not legal. Um, and that, um, even though there's a bias in that, that also sort of aligns with what we learned from Josephus. We're going to talk more about the Pharisees in the New Testament um, in just a little bit, but that's a sort of a general overview. When we, when, when we come to the later Jewish writings, we're talking about the Mishnah and the Tosetta. These are, these are writings that, again, sort of were, were beginning to be collected and co uh, codified in the second century for the Mishnah um, and, and the uh, fifth or sixth century for the, the Tosetta, but, but you know, took an, th hundreds of years, really, for these traditions to develop and be written down. Um, and we see in these later writings um, that there, again, is this debate, this ongoing debate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And this debate has to do with the application of the law. It has to do with purity. It has to do with resurrection. Um, many of these later writings, as we see in the New Testament, also represent some of these characteristics of Josephus um, uh, or the, of the Pharisees that we see in Josephus. Um, and these later writings begin to identify um, uh, 
definitive teachers in Judaism, uh, some of the biggest names in this oral tradition, um, as being uh, Pharisees and, and saying that, you know, Rabbi so-and-so who was a Pharisee. And so one of the functions of that, and certainly one of the consequences of that, is that it is making the claim that rabbinic Judaism, uh, the, the Judaism associated with these very famous, very important rabbis, um, is equivalent, or at least in line with the, the Judaism represented by the Pharisees in the first and second centuries. Um, so so there's, th this is where we begin to see that point of connection between the Pharisees on the one hand and rabbinic Judaism on the other. So I've provided in this slide some, some links that you can go back to and, and learn more information. But um, I presented, I've thrown the fire hose at you for the last uh, 25 minutes. And so I wanna see um, uh, if you're with me, um, if there are questions just about what I've presented th thus far. And let me say that we're gonna, we're gonna dig a little bit deeper about their view of the resurrection um, after, this, after this opportunity to ask questions. So maybe we can table those questions, but just, just wanna see while I sip on my water, if there are any questions or if you know, there's something that, you know, I just assume that you would know that, that maybe you didn't and I need to sort of backtrack something. Um, that would be, I'm, I'm super open to that. So uh, go ahead, you can use your mic or you can use the chat box uh, to uh, clarify anything that I've just presented. All right, hearing, hearing none, we, we might come back to it at the discussion at the end, that's fine. Um, but, you know, uh, as you have that, you know, Word document open, or if you have a piece of scratch paper and something comes to you, feel free to write it down. We can always revisit those questions um, at the end of class. So let me uh, move on to the, the Pharisees and their perspective, their, their, their view of resurrection. So again, the, the first place for us to begin is with Josephus. It's our earliest source on the Pharisees, um, and, um, or at least one of our earliest sources on the Pharisees. And we, we learned two important things uh, about the, their view of the resurrection um, in, in, in Josephus. So the first comes from Jewish War, which was another one of his works, where he describes the, the Jewish revolt against Rome. Um, again, from a very pro-Roman perspective, he says, every soul, the Pharisees maintain, is imperishable, but the soul of the good alone passes into another body, while the souls of the wicked suffer eternal punishment. Now, if you were with me last week, parts of this sound quite familiar, um, particularly from the book of Enoch, right? Where there, remember there were those, those holding cells for the various souls um, and that eventually they would, they would be raised up into judgment. We see, we hear some of those echoes here in Jewish war. The other one we just read, but let, let's hear it again and we'll dig into it. Um, it says that the Pharisees also believe that souls have an immortal rigor in them and that under the earth there will be rewards or punishments according as they have lived viciously or virtuously in this life. And the latter are to be detained in an everlasting prison, but the former shall have power to revive and live again. So just from these two, and these are probably the two most important statements in Josephus, um, at least from the research that I've done about the resurrection and, and the, the Pharisees' view of the resurrection. Right, so, so Eliza, thank you for asking that question. Um, there's, Eliza asked a question in the chat box. Do these, do these texts refer to the reincarnation of the good souls? And wh wh what I would say is, I, I don't think that it imagines a reincarnation in this traditional sense of the word. If by reincarnation, we, you know, we take very seriously the re uh, at the beginning in the sense that, that, that souls would take on another earthly human body um, and live another earthly life, like we might see in the teachings of Hinduism. Um, but it, but it, especially in the Jewish war text, the way that I would read it is, 
that it is trying to maintain that there is this sort of imperishable or immortal soul and that those that are righteous go on to have another body, but not an earthly body, um, but a body in the life that is to come, we might say. Um, so, you know, I, I think one of the important distinctions, and, and I'm sure that there is reason to argue against this and question this, is that, that Jews and Christians have a very linear understanding of history. History is going somewhere. It's, it's on a direction somewhere. Um, and that direction is the rule of God, right? We might, that's probably an easy enough way to say it. Um, whereas um, other, other religious traditions, Hinduism is one that comes to mind, they're more circular right? History um, is not moving in a discrete direction towards a, towards a determined end, but rather is a series of cycles that repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. And so reincarnation in a traditional sense requires that sort of repetitious nature. I think that what Josephus is saying is history has reached its end point um, as we know it, and at that point, they, the, the, the righteous dead receive, their, their souls are revived and they receive a new body in that, that end of time. But it has to be that end of time. It's not just another sort of um, revolution around the, the carousel of life. Um, again, I think that there's probably some room for debate, but I think that that's, that's probably where the distinction would lie. But it's a good question. Um, because you're right, uh, especially in this Jewish war text, to hear the idea of reincarnation, to hear the idea of, of a soul that takes on another body, that sounds a lot like uh, reincarnation. So if I was to summarize some of the, the pieces that we see in these, um, yeah, right, Eliza, exactly. So like our creed says, the resurrection of the body. And this, this I want us to remember what we just read, um, from the Jewish war about, about putting on a body, um, about passing into another body. Because when we study 1 Corinthians 15 and we think about Paul, Paul incidentally is a Pharisee, um, he's wrestling in his own way with just this question. Um, how, does an, how does a soul put on a body that isn't a material body? Because we all know that the material body gets eaten away by worms if you're lucky, um, or worse if you're not. Um, and so, um, so yeah, this, this gets, this is getting us, Josephus is getting us much closer to what we say in the creed about resurrection, that we believe in the resurrection of the body. In many ways, we might say this is, is, a, is, is suggesting that this sort of thinking is in the water, um, in the first century. So let me, let me just sort of summarize some of what I see in these two texts from Josephus. The first is that we see this balancing of what we might call an immortal soul. Um, Platonism, uh, the, the teachings associated with Plato and, and Socrates before him, uh, said that, that all human souls are actually immortal and that the goal of human life is to um, incrementally free the human soul from its attachment to desire, from its attachment to the body, etc. cetera. Um, um, and, and so, so, so we, we begin to see some of that in Josephus, but also this emphasis as Eliza called our attention to, to putting on the body. Um, Josephus says that they're, they're going to experience this power to revive again. It is a new life. It is not just, um, uh, you know, uh, it's not re recitation or resuscitation. It's a new life. They were actually dead. Um, we see, as we saw in many of the texts from last week, this theme of judgments and rewards, um, punishments that are happening. Uh, we see that reference uh, to an everlasting prison. Again, the, the writings of Enoch sound in this. They echo in this, at least to my ears. Um, and that it's, it's interesting that for Josephus, um, he uses the resurrection in a way, but, but doesn't say much about the mechanics of resurrection. He's not getting into the, 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 the nitty gritty of how this happens. Um, and so really what we see in, in, in these, these two texts is this, again, this emphasis on God's power and on the vindication of righteous, of the, of the righteous person, that those who are righteous, that those who live righteously or live the good life will experience um, an extension of life or newness of life after death. Um, uh, I see a question from Mark in the chat box. 
yeah, so Christians don't think that Josephus was inspired by God. As far as I can tell, Josephus never makes the claim to be inspired by God, uh, but he, he does write uh, as someone who is well known, uh, who, who, who well knows scripture and is well known uh, in the things of God. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so, so but I would just say sort of as, a, as, a, as an aside, that but Paul never writes um, as well about being inspired. Um, he never says, you know, I, I was out on an island and the Holy Spirit said, Paul, you need to write to the Philippians. Um, his, 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 um, his reasons for writing and even his positions uh, sometimes are much more clearly his own. He'll say in 1 Corinthians, this is my opinion. This is not a word of the Lord, um, but I still think you should follow it. <laughs> Um, and so, so I think that, I think that there, there are some important, um, um, it, it's an interesting point of comparison. Again, um, the, the, the theological understanding of scripture is one that says these are the, the inspired writings of God, even if Paul, um, in first Corinthians doesn't say the Holy Spirit told me to write it exactly like this. In fact, the book of Revelation is one of the only writings in the New Testament that has that sort of claim to a divine origin to the message, um, at least in its entirety. Again, that's that's a rabbit trail we can go down later, um, but it's a good question mark. Thank you. Um, so uh, again, the this this scholar Claudius Setzer has has said that 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 resurrection in Josephus um, has a number of uh, ha functions as a symbol and has a strategy. Um, and I thought this was really important and, and really telling for our study of the resurrection. The first thing that she says is that as a symbol, the resurrection condenses an entire worldview. And, and, and that we could begin to tease out aspects of that worldview. We might think of things like the goodness of God, the justice of God, um, the benefits of following the law of God or the Torah of God or the teachings of God, um, that in, in or the power of God. That, that in a single word or a single concept like um, the, the, the resurrection, there is a claim uh, to, to a whole worldview. And that as a symbol, um, many symbols are by design imprecise. That's sort of the power of the symbol that you, that you can then uh, allow, you can say resurrection, and people can begin to fill that symbol in with their different understandings. And so it might be important that in his discussion of the resurrection, there is some imprecision in, in the description, um, that insofar as it captures a whole worldview, or we might say a whole Jewish culture, um, uh, th that not spelling out the specifics, the yeses and the nos, actually is, lends it some power. Setzer also says that um, as, a, as a, both a symbol and a strategy, the resurrection has a community creating function. Um, as, as we see in Josephus, there are those who affirm the resurrection and there are those who don't affirm the resurrection. And, uh, and certainly as the resurrection becomes something that is a part of the Jewish liturgy, um, it becomes a boundary marker. Um, it, it, it includes people and it excludes people um, in, in this way. And then the, the major strategy that Setzer points out is that, that the, the resurrection really solves problems. And if you've been a part of this study in the past weeks, you know what that problem is. Ultimate, ultimately, it's the justice of God, it's the goodness of God, it's the power of God. And um, it looks at the world, this life, this, this lived experience that says, I don't see the justice of God, I don't see the power of God, I don't see the benefit of following God, and it, and it solves that problem by, as I've said at the beginning, by delaying the justice of God, by, by putting it forward to the end of history. And Setzer says, in this way, it makes, it makes it durable. It makes it possible to live a life with those sorts of contradictions. Um, and I, again, I just think, as we think about the resurrection in our own day, and certainly as we think about the resurrection in the New Testament, many of these are, are also at play. They're also at work. Um, in our in our understanding of the resurrection, and certainly in the New Testament's understanding of the resurrection, um, so um, so yeah, let me let me move on then to our our discussion of Paul the Pharisee and Jesus the, the Pharisee, or the possibility that Jesus was a Pharisee. So the first thing to note is that that Paul is uh, the first and maybe only Jew to identify himself as a Pharisee in his surviving writings. 
Um, and so, Dennis, I see your question about whether or not Josephus claimed to be a Pharisee. And, and this is, I'll, I'll dig into it. And if you have a source, um, feel free to put it in the chat box. But I don't, I don't think that, that he identified himself necessarily as a Pharisee, although he might have aligned himself with the Pharisees. He may have thought that their views, their teachings were, were the most reliable or the most authentic. Um, but again, I'm not sure um, uh, simply because there, that we have so, so limited uh, a, a number of sources about the Pharisees that, that Paul sort of stands out um, uh, among these ancient writings because he identifies himself as a Pharisee. Um, and sort of has a firsthand account of being a Pharisee, of course, being a Christian Pharisee, um, as, well, as we see. Um, and so in the letters of Paul, um, Philippians 3, Galatians 1, these are both places, Philippians 3 in particular, where he identifies himself clearly, um, um, he, he clearly identifies himself as a Pharisee um, in Philippians 3. Galatians 1, it's a little bit more of a roundabout way of going about it. Um, and then in Acts, the book of Acts, um, which sometimes there's a tension in between how Paul is presented in Acts and how he appears in his letters. Um, in Acts, we see that, that Paul, in almost all of his defenses, in his defense speeches near the end of Acts, um, he's saying, I'm on trial for the resurrection of, uh, for my belief in the resurrection. I'm on trial for, for maintaining this sort of basic um, Pharisaic understanding of God and God's purposes. Um, and so I've, I, in, the, in the slides, I've put um, the three speeches that are really relevant to this, and I'm not going to read them because we're running short on time, um, but you can go back and see that in each of them, um, Paul sort of points to his identity as a Pharisee on the one hand and connects this identity of being a Pharisee with a belief in the resurrection. Um, which then again aligns with this idea that the Pharisees were, were really the, the, the school that, that affirmed the resurrection um, within early Judaism. And so um, what do we see in the book of Acts? We see that, that Paul presents the resurrection as sort of a basic understanding of being a Pharisee. He has what we might call a general or a universal understanding of resurrection. That is to say, it's not a few really, really good and a few really, really bad people that are raised, but all people will be raised and all people will sort of give an account of themselves before God. Um, one of the things we noted last week is that this, this individualism, this understanding understanding of the resurrection in very individualistic terms is something that began to formulate. This was a development um, in, the, in the maybe the first century CE or, or a little bit beforehand. One of the things that Paul says is that, that Jesus is the first fruit or the down payment uh, is another way we might think about it of resurrection. That, that Paul seems to be saying because Jesus was raised, we also know that all humans will be raised um, and that, that because this human named Jesus was raised, we can trust that God will also work resurrection in the lives of others. Now, there is, there is similar um, sort of defense speeches in Acts 3 and 4, of course, not by Pharisees. Um, at least we don't know them as Pharisees, um, by, by, by Peter um, in Acts 3 and 4, um, where it seems like Peter is on trial for the resurrection. Um, again, um, sort of pointing to uh, what, he, what Peter is maintaining as a traditional belief um, in Judaism, and, and why, would, why would I be on trial for this, is sort of the subtext of Acts 3 and 4. Now, I want to close just with this, this, this question about Jesus, and I'll say, you know, at the beginning of this, that, that we, don't, we, we, don't, we don't have Jesus ever saying that he's a Pharisee. We don't have any gospel saying that Jesus was a Pharisee. Um, but, it's, but it's more of trying to say, wow, a lot of the ways that Jesus taught um, and thought um, reflect this, this understanding of the resurrection um, and even other aspects of the Pharisees um, to suggest that um, there's, there's some interesting points of connection. So remember last week we talked about Matthew 25 and Luke 16, and both of these sort of contain an understanding of the resurrection, or at least parts of the resurrection, that, that resonate with what we've seen in Josephus. There is the, the judgment of the just and the unjust. There is a setting right. There is, um, in Matthew 25, all of the nations, there's this universal judgment that we see coming through. Um, 
And then um, when we, we see in the Gospels, like in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus sort of presents himself as a rival to the Sadducees. Now, of course, Jesus is presented as a rival to the Pharisees as well. He disagrees with them as well. So that's clear evidence that Jesus is not a, a run-of-your-mill Pharisee, but he's certainly presented in the Gospels as a part of these larger conversations. Um, and so here's our final text for tonight. This is from Matthew, 25, Matthew 22. Many of you will know this story. This is the question that the Sadducees posed to Jesus. And the Sadducees, the Gospel of Matthew tells us, don't believe in the resurrection. Same thing that we hear from Josephus. Um, and they sort of present this problem. Like, imagine that a guy gets married, um, uh, and then he dies. And because of Jewish Levitical laws, this, this wife, the, the brother of this man, must marry the, the widow. And that this happens seven times. And then in the afterlife, the Sadducee says, you know, how crazy are you to believe in the afterlife? Because who, who, would, who would this woman be married to? Um, she had seven husbands in this life. Which one is going to be her spiritual or her, you know, heavenly husband? Um, and of course, Jesus answers this, this question, as he does in a lot of the gospel texts, by sort of saying, you're asking the wrong question. Um, and he says, um, he says, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And I've underlined this text because the, the sort of accusation against the Sadducees is that they don't know scripture and that they don't know the power of God. And that both of those are sort of um, are turning pieces in other discussions between Sadducees and Pharisees. And so, again, Jesus is presented as being a part of this larger milieu, this larger environment. Um, and then he makes this really, really provocative statement in verse 32, sort of the definitive piece of the argument is that the identity of God is ultimately not the identity of the dead, but the, the identity of the living. And that in verse, you know, when, 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 when God is identified as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, he, this is spoken in a present tense in, in the sense that these, these folks, these patriarchs, are still alive in the presence of God. And so we, we begin to see that, that this response um, maybe doesn't have a resurrection of the body. It, it does seem to suggest sort of that, that souls live on in, you know, eternally, um, at least Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, and so it's, it's just, a, it's, again, it's just, it's an interesting text that presents Jesus as in line with the, the larger teaching um, of, of, of the Pharisees around, around the resurrection. So we, we have about five minutes left uh, of class. And Dennis, I see your comment in the, in the comment box. Thanks for that resource. I, I think you're probably right. And I'll go check it out. And, um, uh, but, I'm, but I'm guessing that you're right, that, that Josephus does um, in his life um, identify himself as a Pharisee. And, and thanks for helping me uh, remember that or, or see that um, and for the reference. But I want to see if, if there are other questions um, about, about what I've what I've presented on this evening. I'm going to go ahead and um, stop the recording at this point. So thanks for watching if you watch.